We've been talking about Jesus more or less up to now. Tonight I'm going to talk about the devil. And I want to declare at the outset that God didn't make a devil. Though he's been blamed for it. You know, God gets blamed for a lot of things. People live as they please in sinful pleasure. They prosper and don't need God. But as soon as misfortune strikes, they ask, why did God do this? That bothers me. Doesn't it bother you? A man goes and drinks all the liquor he can hold, climbs in a fast car and goes flying down the highway, plows into a tree, ends up in a hospital with his neck broken, and he wants to know, why did God do this? Devil did it. I'm tired of my God being blamed and not thanked. Something wonderful happens, oh, that's good luck. Got plenty to eat? That's our farmers. Beautiful autumn color? That's Jack Frost. Get well? Oh, wonderful doctor. Am I right? Get a hold of a little money? I earned that. Buy a television set? Oh, isn't science wonderful? Never thank God for anything. But as soon as we're in trouble, we put the blame on God. Let's put it where it belongs, on the devil. Even when you have your house insured, you know, they have clauses in there. They won't pay off in case of an act of God, a flood, unless you buy special insurance, a tornado. Isn't it awful to associate all that stuff with God, an act of God? Now, beloved, not long ago, 22 prominent preachers were interviewed by a large national magazine, and only one of them said he believed in the devil. That is, he believed there was a devil. Well, you might as well know tonight, I believe there's a devil. You know why? Because of the devil men. Now, you get rid of devil men, and I'll stop believing in the devil. I believe in the devil because Christ talked about one. I believe in the devil because the Bible validates a devil. And I believe whatever the Bible says, don't you? The devil is alive tonight and he is as real as God is. And you'd better believe it. But God didn't make a devil. The Bible says when God did the creating every good work, Everything that came from God was good. Everything that he did was perfect. God does not make devils. Then how do we explain the origin of evil from a study of the word of God? We have to go way back. Way back in the remote annals of the past, there was among God's created beings a powerful angel. He was made by God an angel. He was perfect in every way. And he was named Lucifer. I saw a breakdown of that name somewhere. Lucifer. The first part comes from lux, which means light. And the other part fair from a word like transfer, meaning to carry. He was the light carrier or the light bearer. He was an angel with special privilege. The Bible tells us something about him and about his superior being. I'm reading from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, and I'm starting with verse 12. And I want you to listen, please. The Bible says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. This is the figure representing the devil. It'll be very clear in a moment. Listen. Take up a lamentation and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius and the topaz and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald and the carbuncle and gold, and the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. 
Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 17, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And there we have it. In the beginning, God created a great and powerful and beautiful angel. That angel was perfect in all his ways. The Bible says his pipes were created in him. Now, I've never heard the voice of an angel. I've never heard an angel sing, but I imagine it must be something. One writer who had researched this thoroughly suggested that Lucifer could sing four-part harmony at one time all by himself. He had these pipes built into his throat. And when he opened his mouth to sing, he was a quartet. The Bible says he was a covering cherub. What is that? A cherubim is a two-winged angel. And in the earthly sanctuary, God told Moses to make two cherubim out of gold, beaten gold. They were angels with one wing up in the air overspreading like that and placed on either side of the mercy seat where God manifested his presence through the visible glory of the holy Shekinah. On either side of the mercy seat, they formed a covering with their wings over the person of God. Well, that was a type of what's in reality in heaven. Up in heaven, there are two powerful angels that always attended the presence of God. They are the covering cherubim, and Lucifer was one of those. He had a high and exalted position. He was angelic choir leader. leader. You know, you always hear people bragging about what they do in church, you know, and some folk think because they sing in the choir, that makes them special. Sometimes I tell those folk, the devil got started in the choir. And I don't know why. God's got some good choirs, but the devil also gets in a lot of choirs. Isn't that right? <laughs> Feels at home in choirs. He was the choir leader. Perfect, beautiful, talented, leader, covering cherub. Until iniquity was found in him. Ladies and gentlemen, he was created, yes, but he was not created a devil. When God made him, he was a perfect angel. There was not a trace of sin in him. And yet sin originated with Lucifer. And the reason the Bible gives is his heart was lifted up because of his beauty. If you understand that, would you say amen? Oh, beloved, the Bible says, what doth the Lord require of a man? but to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. God wants men and women who love him to be humble. No matter how far you go in school, don't become a fool. Be humble. No matter how much you acquire, no matter where you live in a town, don't you ever get so high and mighty that you can't associate with God's other children who happen to be poor and modest. God declares that he hates a proud look. Proverbs 6 and verse 17. Oh, you say, but pride seems like such a small thing. Well, sin got started small, and then it grew into the awesome mess we behold it to be today. When I was a little boy, there was a neighbor. His name was Mr. Woods. And one day he was sitting on his front porch trimming his toenails with a knife. And while he was doing that, the knife slipped and cut his toe. And it bled a little, you know. And Mr. Woods looked at that thing and... He was just a little old Nick, so he forgot it. Put his sock on and went on about his business. Wasn't too long after that, he began to have real problems. The old toe began to turn dark, and he went to the doctor. The doctor said, man, you've got gangrene in that toe. Why didn't you come to the doctor? Oh, he said it was just a little thing. I didn't think it mattered. And so they cut the toe off. Now he had to stay off his job for weeks and weeks and weeks, and he wouldn't get well. Went back to his doctor, and the doctor said, you know one thing? That gangrene is spreading on up in the foot. So they cut his foot off. 
And after that, they cut his leg off at the knee. And the last time I saw Mr. Woods alive, his pants leg was empty from here down. And it all started with a little old nick. Oh, beloved, let us watch the little things and the big things will take care of themselves. Would you say amen? God said he hates pride. The devil got started with pride. Small, you think. And yet God says, I hate a proud look. In 1 Peter 5, 8, 5, 5, the Bible says, God resisteth the proud. And in Proverbs 21 and verse 4, the Bible says, a proud heart is a sin. Ladies and gentlemen, it's here that iniquity began to germinate in the heart of Lucifer, who was a free moral agent and could choose to do wrong if he wanted to. And it started to grow, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew, until tonight the devil is the most wretched, miserable rascal in all of God's universe. And he has caused enough pain and sickness and bloodshed and death to last a millennium. Started small. Well, it's amazing how people can be so proud. And some of them have so little to be proud of. Doesn't matter how they look, how homely they are. You know, most of us are homely. Sin has done that to us. Doesn't matter how homely they are, they'll go down to the store and buy a few things and then they'll stand in the front of a mirror and primp and swagger and strut and, and put on curlers and permanents. And I'm talking about men. To say nothing of the fairer sex, proud men spend as much time primping today and buying cosmetics as women. Fingernails polished. Lucifer had lived in absolute freedom and liberty and perfection in heaven. He had every reason to be happy. Don't you think if you were in heaven, that close to God, superior to most of the others, don't you think you could have been happy? Lucifer had every cause to be happy, but he began to covet the prerogatives of God. He got jealous of Jesus. And so from his lofty position of angel leader and covering cherub, he has become fallen, and tonight he is known even in the scriptures as the dragon the serpent and the devil. Fierce as a dragon. He doesn't care anything about you. He will grin and flatter and charm. And you'll think he's a wonderful fella till he gets you in a mess. Then he'll run off and leave you by yourself to face the music. That's the kind of devil he is. He's no friend and he's no good. He has no scruples about what he does. He'd just soon kill a million people as one. That's the kind of rascal he is, fierce as a dragon, strong as a lion, and as cunning as a snake. And as his heart became lifted up with pride, he was no longer contented with his position. He was no longer content to be just a covering cherub. He was no longer satisfied just to be angel leader and choir leader and all these other things God had privileged him to be. He decided he wanted to be God. Are you listening to me, beloved? Now, I want to tell you something. Somebody has to be God. Hear what I said? Somebody is going to be God. Now, if you don't let God be God, then somebody else is going to be. There's some folks for whom a girlfriend is God. There's some folks for whom money is God. There's some folks for whom a job or position, or a certain circle of friends becomes God. If you don't worship the true God, you're going to worship something because we are made like that. We recognize our limitations and our needs, and we know that there are times when we cannot take care of ourselves of ourselves, so it's born in us to crave a higher power to look after us and make us feel secure. And if we don't find that security in the true God, we'll find it in money. We'll be stupid enough to think that if we can get so many thousands of dollars in the bank, we got it made. Oh, when will we learn that you cannot replace happiness with money? 
Would you say amen out there? Oh, you can buy a lot of things, but folk who get them are not satisfied. There are people, you know, who think with that with the acquisition of things, they'll be happy. And they're in a rat race all the time. And every time they get one thing, before they can enjoy it, they're after something else. Isn't that right? These are covetous people who are always watching other people. They look out the window and they see their neighbor getting a color TV. And theirs is black and white. And that puts them in a lather. They can't even sleep at night. They got to go in debt. They got to have a family council. Can't even take care of the children. Got to go down and go in debt and buy a color TV. And after they've done all they can do to get it, and the man hauls it in, and they think they can sit down now and enjoy it, they look out the window, and that neighbor's got a new stereo. So they upset again. Isn't that right? No happiness in things. Now, somebody, something has got to be God in your life. Choose this day whom you will serve. If you don't choose the true God, you're going to worship an idol. You might not bow down to a statue made out of wood or stone, but you're going to worship an idol such as friends or money or job or position or, or, or pleasure or sex or something. Now, this fellow Lucifer decided... He was going to be God. I'm reading Isaiah chapter 14 and beginning with verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of, of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth tremble, and that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, and opened not the house of his prisoners? Here God is judging Lucifer. It said, you said in your heart, I'm going to be God. Did you notice how many times he used I in that reference? I am going to sin. I am going to sit. I am going to be like God. When a man gets too full of I, he's full of nothing. That's what makes people devils today. I ahead of God. My will ahead of God's will. My opinion ahead of scripture. We're just like the devil when we do that. That's what ruined him. This rebellion went on in his heart, and it grew, and it grew, until finally it burst out into the first known sin. And the devil began to sow strife up in heaven. It started where? In heaven. Up there where there was nothing but peace and glory and goodness, sin got started. The devil began to sow strife up there. He began to criticize God. He told the angels that God was unfair. That's the same lie he tells when he says you can't obey God. He is saying that God has told you to do something you can't do. And if you believe that, you believe what he told the angels, that God is unfair. And he sowed these seeds and he carried it on. He criticized and he complained and he murmured and he bellyached until one third of all the heavenly host joined him in his rebellion. Finally, there was war in heaven, and the Bible says the dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. I'm going to Revelation chapter 12, and I'm going to read verses 7 and 8. Listen. And there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Would you say amen out there? Revelation 12, 7 to 9. Oh, I can't run by that without saying hallelujah for something. The Bible says there was a war in heaven, and Michael fought. What does Michael mean? The Bible calls Michael the archangel. Well, what does that mean? Michael. The last part of that word is from Elohim, a contraction of God. The name means one who is as God. That's Jesus, folks. And he's called archangel. Arch means king or ruler, ruler of angels. One who is like God who rules angels. That's Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? And the devil fought against Christ and Christ fought with his angels. And the part that makes me say hallelujah is this part that says the dragon fought 
and prevailed not. I'm glad the devil can't lick Jesus, aren't you? Not only in heaven, he couldn't lick him down here on earth. Christ left glory, put on the form of a man, and met the devil on his own turf. The devil had the home field advantage. And he tried his devilish best to destroy Jesus, but he couldn't even defeat Christ when Jesus had fasted for 40 days. A hungry God is stronger than a full devil. Would you say amen out there? Then he met Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Tried his best to draw him down to hell, but an angel came down and wiped the death dew from Jesus' brow. Christ raised up his head and said, Father, not my will but thine be done. He licked the devil again. So the devil had to wait a little while till he got him out on Calvary's tree. And then they drove the nails in his hands and they hung him up there to die. And the devil abused the Lord. He had all these wicked people cursing the Lord. He had all of these people mocking him, wagging their heads, making fun of him. Had him up there hanging on a cross like a no good common thief. Nails, rusty nails driven through his hands and feet. Jesus hanging there, his tongue swelling in his mouth. He said, I thirst. And the devil told somebody, give him some wine. And they sent up some fermented wine. The authorized Bible calls it vinegar. It was fermented. And when Jesus got a whiff of it, he would not drink it. Even in dying, he'd rather bear the pain than be cloud his brain. Would you say amen out there? Finally, Jesus died. And I imagine that even though the earth quaked and had convulsions, when Jesus died, the old devil must have rejoiced. We got him. You see, the grave is called the devil's prison house. He'd been locking folks in there for 4,000 years. And all he was waiting on was the Son of God to die. He didn't know if he could kill him or not. But when Christ screamed in his passion, dropped his head in the hollow of his shoulder and died, the devil rejoiced. I got him. Don't know if I told you this, but I read it somewhere. It's an allegory. It said that death and hell met at the cross. Hell from the Greek Hades, which means the grave. And it says that death and hell stood at the foot of the cross. And when Jesus died, they slapped one another on the back and they shook hands. For death had said to hell, if I deliver him, will you keep him? And hell said, if you deliver him, I'll keep him. So when Jesus died, death turned to hell and said, okay, I got him. Now I'm putting him in your hands. I want to know if you can keep him. And so they laid Jesus in the tomb. And he sealed the tomb with Roman mortar. And the devil and his host came to watch the tomb. And the Roman soldiers came to watch the tomb. And the allegory says that as Jesus was sleeping that Friday evening, that old death called up hell. And he said, hell, have you still got him? Hell said, I got him. The stone is in place. The soldiers are on guard. The devil is right here to hold things together. I got him. Early the next morning, which was the Sabbath, old hell and death had a little contact, and death said, hell, have you still got him? And hell said, don't worry about a thing. The stone is still in place. The soldiers are still on guard. Nothing's happened. He hasn't moved. I got him. About 5 o'clock, Sabbath afternoon, Death said, hell, have you still got him? Hell said, I told you not to worry. I got him. Nothing has changed. Death and hell didn't know that Jesus was just keeping the Sabbath. Sunset Saturday night. Death said, hell, have you still got him? Or he said, why don't you quit bothering me? I got him. Early Sunday morning, death came out to the garden and he said, hell, what you got to say? Have you still got him? And hell said, well, well, death, you see, it was like this. I thought everything was secure, but a great light fell from glory. And not only did the soldiers fall as dead men, but the devil took off. I thought I could count on the devil. He even took off. And all of a sudden, an angel touched the ground, and, and the ground shook, and that old stone rolled out of the way like a marble. And that angel stood, and he cried into me, and he said, Jesus, thou son of God, your father calls you. And he got up, 
and he walked out and he said I couldn't hold him I couldn't hold him and death that isn't all when he got out far enough he turned around and with a mighty scorn on his face and with some golden keys hanging on the girdle of his garment he turned around and he looked right at me and he insulted both of us he said death where is thy sting grave where is thy victory Oh, I got to leave this alone. The, the point I wanted to make was that, 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 that the devil has always fought against Jesus, but he never won. Bible says he prevailed not. Now the devil is fighting Jesus over you. But he doesn't have to win unless you agree for him to win. I know that he's tried to win from time to time. You see, he doesn't like me preaching to folks the way I preach to him. And he's tried to do all kinds of things. He's tried to wreck my car on the highway. And, and you know, I've been driving down the road, and I hear something say to me, you better slow up right here. I don't even know why I do, because I got the right away. But when I slow up, some drunken fool that the devil had gotten lined up goes bursting through the stop sign, and I say, thank the Lord. I'm on a winning team. <laughs> devil can't do me no harm as long as I'm sheltered in the palm of the Lord Jesus Christ. He that is with me is greater than he who is against me. The dragon fought and prevailed not. Not going to give him any credit. Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Luke 10 and verse 18. Now some interesting question. Why didn't God kill him? Well, God didn't kill him for several reasons. Number one, if you had a son who went astray, would you kill him first thing? Number two, the angels would have believed that maybe the devil had something on God. If he had moved with vengeance that quickly. Number three, the angels would have thought that God wasn't a God of love. But a God of vengeance. And they would have worshipped him out of fear. And God won't accept worship out of fear. You got folk who join the church because they're scared they're going to hell. They're going anyhow. Unless they get converted, would you say amen? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandment. Not if you're scared. When the Bible says fear God, it doesn't mean be scared. It means respect him. And reverence him. And God didn't want anybody worshiping him because they were forced to. You got people who think God's going to make them do right. No, he isn't. God wants you to love him and then to serve him freely. And you've got a mind of your own. He's not going to make you and the devil can't make you do wrong. You've got to decide to serve God. And nobody can stop you from making that decision. It's got to be voluntarily based on love. Now, you men who aren't married, don't you know you could go out tonight with a stick and knock a woman in the head and throw her in the back of your car and take her to some private place and you got yourself a wife? You can kidnap one. Well, who wants a wife like that? I wouldn't have her on a 10-foot pole. The woman that I married had to be crazy about me. As I am crazy about her. You understand me, don't you? Otherwise, what good is it? The Lord says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if God had moved on the devil immediately to destroy him, his character would not have been vindicated. And the angels would have feared him. And so the Lord let sin play out its role. And he let sin bring his only begotten son to the cross. And when Jesus died and the devil thought he had won, far from it. When Jesus died, Christ had vindicated the love of God. Not only for man, but for angels and unfallen worlds. The cross has settled the issue of sin for the entire universe. Would you say amen out there? Dr. Taylor said they thought that if they could get him on the cross, they could destroy his name. But God had another idea. God said, I'm going to give him a name above all names, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Would you say amen out there? Blessed be the name of Jesus. You can't stop God. On the cross. 
once he settled the issue of sin. God's going to get rid of sin. There are people who wonder why he didn't do it way back there. And those same people won't let him get rid of it in them. They hold on to it. They kiss it. They pamper it. They pet it. One Christian writer speaks of our darling sins. We got some sins we're ashamed of. We've got some sins we don't want people to know about. But we also have some little pet sins. Isn't that right? Some little old things that we keep under our coats, you know. Some little old sins that we enjoy so much, we just smile when we think about them. Those are our darling sins. We love them so much, we won't even let God with all of his power get rid of those in our lives. And yet we wonder, why didn't God get rid of sin? Well, instead of getting rid of it, he made a provision for it. In Genesis chapter 3, he said to Adam and Eve, I am going to put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And I'm going to open up the doors of salvation. Even though you have fallen and deserve to die, I'm going to give you eternal life through my promised son. God made a provision. And at the cross, the devil was defeated. That's why Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12 says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens. Do what? Why? Because the devil has been kicked out now. He can't go running to and fro as he did in the days of Job. All the unfallen worlds are sick of him. When they saw how he treated Jesus on the cross, their cup was filled up. They are disgusted with the devil forever. They don't want him around them anymore. No longer has he any influence, so he can't leave this earth. Revelation 12, 12 says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Why? Because the devil can't bother you anymore. But it goes on to say, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Would you say amen out there? Now that's the devil. Where is he? He's in the earth. What's wrong with him? He's mad. Why is he mad? He knows he's got but a short time. He wants you to think you got plenty of time. You hear God's word? He told, oh, don't, don't worry about it. Oh, don't worry about that. After all, you are young. And the Bible says he knows that he only has a short time. Oh, he's a dreadful, mean rascal. He has no scruples. He has no mercy. Nothing is too wicked or too bad for him. The devil is a mess. I had a nephew, my sister's son, raised up in the church, went into the Marine Corps, sort of turned his back on the Lord. But as soon as he got in there, he began to realize his mistake. And he'd write letters home, and he'd tell my sister, and tell his brother, look, I made a mistake. He'd say to his brother, don't you do what I've done. You stay close to the Lord. The Lord was working on his heart. Within six months after going in, they sent him to Vietnam. I was on my way to see him. The Red Cross was going to bring him in from the battlefield so I could talk to him about his soul. And while I was en route, three communist bullets tore his head off. That's how the devil is. Nothing is too mean, too rotten, too bad. The first attack is to get you to sin, to disobey God, to refuse to believe in God. And if he can't do that, then he will attack your body with sickness and disease. He'll wreck your car. He'll burn down your house. He'll kill your baby. Are you listening to me? Why do people love him and cooperate with him so? Anybody would rather serve the devil than serve the Lord is insane. Would you say amen out there? Because that's the kind of devil he is. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, Peter said, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, an adversary is an enemy, your adversary the devil goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If I announced to you tonight that two lions were loose in this section of Washington, you'd spend the night in the Warner Theater. And yet there are devils out there by the millions. And the Bible says they're like roaring lions. But we dance up to them and we play with them and we tease them and we cooperate with them and we pat them on the head. Devils! And we defend their filth. You say the Lord is good and somebody will argue with you. What do you mean the Lord is good? But you say something against one of these old rock groups and they'll take your head off. They'll defend the devil but won't speak a word for the Lord. Would you say amen out there? The Bible says one day God's going to say to the wicked, depart from me. 
into the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. You know, the devil wants you to think that he's down in hell right now turning over sinners with a pitchfork. You ever hear that? He wants you to think he's the superintendent of hell. Well, I want to tell you something. When hell burns, the devil is going to be the kindling. He is going to burn up. He's not going to have any pitchfork because pitchforks are going to burn up. Would you say amen? The devil wants you to think he's down in You know, people are more confused about hell than almost anything I ever heard of. You ever hear anybody say it's hot as hell? In the wintertime, those same folks will say it's cold as hell. They don't know what hell means. Isn't it? Devil has created all this palaver and foolishness to confuse the mind. God has prepared hell for the devil and for his angels, not for you. Why do you insist on going? The Bible says in, in Malachi 4 and verse 1, the day that cometh shall burn them up and leave them neither root nor branch. Well, I've settled one thing. The devil is not down yonder. He's here. If you don't believe it, walk out there and go up and down the street. You'll see. You'll see it in violence. You'll see it in old filthy shows. You'll see it in selfishness. You'll see it in people not treating one another right. What's he doing in Washington, D.C.? He's selling 15 billion sex magazines a month in this country alone. That's what he's doing. What else is he doing? He's promoting filth and defending it of every stripe and sort. Things that we used to wouldn't even talk about. Devil's got folks doing tonight. What else is he doing? He delights in war. For he can sweep thousands at one time into Christless graves. What else is he doing? He's making folks hate one another who don't even know one another. What else is the devil doing? He's got folks settling dope, ruining our sons and our daughters. Over a thousand dollars is spent for dope for every dollar given to the church. I lift an offering out here and suspicious devils say, you see, they're after your money. And those same folk will spend $380 a year on cigarettes alone. That's what the devil is doing. What else is he doing? He's selling whiskey. More than ever before in the history of this nation. He's making people sick. He's a liar and the father of it. John 8, 44. What else is he doing? He's wrecking cars and mangling bodies and running over Christians who are trying to get to the Warner Theater so they can record the sermon. What else is he doing? He's stealing and he's murdering and he's creating heartbreak and heartache. Nothing is too dirty for him to do. That's what he's doing. He is in the earth, but his time is running out. And he knows it. When Jesus comes, the jig is up. And I want to live in a world without a devil. Let's bring the screen down and cut off the lights. And let's go to the screen now and close our service in these last few minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to preach about some more of this later on. Right now, suffice it to say, I'm looking forward to the coming of Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to live in a land where nobody ever gets sick. I want to live in a land where they don't have an HAACP. That's a heavenly association for the advancement of colored folks. I want to live in a land where everybody loves everybody. I want to live in a land where you don't have to have padlocks on your door because nobody steals. Amen. I want to live in a land where you don't have to watch your little boys and girls. Oh, let's go here now to the screen and let's get some representations to help us understand this. First of all, Lucifer was created by God, not a devil. He was a powerful and glorious angel. He could sing four-part harmony. He was angelic choir leader, but he had a problem. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. And folks are like that now. You know, it's a sad thing, but some folks won't be saved just because they're pretty. They, they have been pretty all their lives, and they're self-centered, and they think too much of themselves, and they glorify themselves, and folk like that are selfish. That's why there's so many ugly folks. They have a chance to be saved. Let's say amen. Now, some pretty folks going to be saved. You know what I mean, don't you? But people's hearts are lifted up because of their looks and because of their intellects. That's what the latter part says. Corrupted 
his wisdom by reason of his brightness. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's what made him a devil. Too much I. Take the I out of sin. You don't even have sin. S I N. And so there was war in heaven. Michael fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into what? He wants you to think he's down yonder when he's out yonder. Not only that, I'm going to show you something incredible. The devil was cast out, you see, and he and those superhuman beings are literally crawling the earth full of devilment, full of evil. They are down here creating all the problems you read about every day in the newspaper. All of those things they blame on God, that's the devil's work. Would you say amen out there? That's what he specializes in. You saw a picture there to depict the creation of the world. And then God formed a garden eastward. It was called Eden. And God then made Adam and Eve after he had made all these beautiful, peaceful animals. And he gave Adam dominion over these animals. In those days, a lion and a cow were all at the feet of Adam. And he named them all. And then God saw it was not good that man should be alone. And he made a woman for him to be in help me. And they had everything that any heart could desire in order to be happy. God put them in the Garden of Eden with all its perfection to dress and keep it. But alas, a serpent, a medium the devil would work through, came in the garden. And he spoke to Eve and said, Yea, hath not God said? I told you I looked that word up, yea. It's a light greeting. It was like saying hi. You have to get folks' attention before you can deceive them. You women, when you walk in the streets and some old good-for-nothing says, Hi there. Don't stop walking. That's what the devil did in the Garden of Eden. Would you say amen? And he deceived Eve. Adam also ate, not being deceived. And then came the angel with the flaming sword and drove them with dripping bloody animal skins out of the Garden of Eden. And the devil usurped their authority and became the prince of this world. That's why Jesus had to come to buy it back or redeem it. That rotten devil has been here ever since. This is his headquarters. There was a time he could go up to heaven. Read Job chapter 1. But after he did what he did to Jesus, he was nailed. And he is proscribed now. He can't go anywhere except here on earth and up in the air around the earth where he can make airplanes crash and act a fool up there. Are you following me? Therefore the Bible says, woe. Woe means trouble. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. The Bible says he's like a roaring lion. They tell me that a lion doesn't kill a lot, that is the male lion. I read somewhere that it's the female that does most of the killing. The male just eats and sleeps. And they say when he's hungry, he fills his mouth with air and he lets go a blood-curdling roar. And I read that impala and small animals just hear his roar and they get so scared they are immobilized. They stand trembling like this. And while they're standing trembling, he lies down and his wife collects groceries. You know how he got him? With his roar. There's some folks out here tonight who are scared because he's roaring. He's already told you you can't obey. You haven't even tried yet. That's just his roar. And you standing there trembling. He's told you if you obey God and keep the Sabbath, you're going to lose your job. You haven't lost it yet. You haven't even asked your boss for time off. You just heard the devil roar. You're standing there trembling. The devil, your adversary, as a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. And he wants you to think he looks like that. You know why he wants you to think like he looks like that? So that you won't recognize him when he comes after your daughter. He doesn't want you to recognize him. So he wants you to carry this caricature in your mind. Horns and hoofs and a tail. That's a lie that came out of the dark ages. 
You fool with me, I'll tell you why it came out. Frightening people into giving money to the church. That's what it was. The devil is abroad in the land, robbing the poor and making the rich richer. Overcharging and extorting. So that tonight, 8% of the population of the world controls 80% of its wealth. And people are starving to death while we sit here. Crime being committed every 20 seconds. Rape up 95% over last year. That's the work of the devil. Let's say amen out there. Religious, or rather perilous times and moral degeneracy and a decline of religion. That's what the devil is doing tonight. He's destroying faith in God. Wherever people will listen to him and listen to his roar. He's telling them you don't have to do this and you don't have to do that in spite of what the Bible says clearly. That's what he's doing. And his pet is war. The devil knows that with war and with these mighty weapons, he can sweep multiplied thousands into eternity without God while their passions are excited, while they are despising one another. He knows they're not fit for the kingdom of God. Way back in 1945, one bomb dropped over Hiroshima, killed 75,000 people in less than two seconds. That's what he's into. Now, I want to show you something, and I hope it doesn't upset you. I don't know how well you can see it, but that's a picture given to me, given to me by a Vietnam veteran. Those are human heads. That's what the devil is into. Nothing is too bad for him. He maims and destroys. 150,000 men came back in dishonor who were also maimed, many of them without legs and arms and many of them never to be married and never to father a child. For what? And 55,000 came back as my nephew did in a box. That's what the devil is into. And yet we walk in darkness. He is the prince of darkness. Tonight, I invite you to walk in the light, church. What do you say? Let's listen to what God says. And let's do what God says, because God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. The Bible says, Then shall he say unto them on his left hand, or the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil, and who? Yes, sir. Fires of hell are for the devil and his angels. And one day they're going to rain down from heaven, the Bible says. Fire and brimstone, it's going to fall. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Revelation 20 and verse 9. And then it says, I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. You thought I was kidding when I said he was going to be the kindling. God says I'm going to start a fire right in the middle of you. I'm going to bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth, and never shalt thou be any more. Now is the time to say amen. If you are tired of the devil, and if you are tired of devil men, if you are tired of being pushed around and abused and hurt and lied about and talked about and mistreated, if you are tired of deprivation, if you are tired of hard times, if you're tired of not having enough to make ends meet, if you're tired of going to the hospital, if you're tired of cancer, if you're tired of lumbago and arthritis, if you're tired of bad teeth, if you're tired of walking sticks and wheelchairs and crutches, if you're tired of all this stuff that is the result of the devil's work, then you ought to read that with me and say amen. Never shalt thou be anymore. And the Bible says that when the fire begins to burn, the devil is going to be the chief burner and God's going to burn him up and turn him to ashes. And then the Bible says, what do, you, what do ye imagine against the Lord? Affliction shall not rise up the second time. The old Negro slave understood that. He was heavily burdened as a slave. But he sang, I'm going to lay down my sword and shield and study one no more. He knew what he was talking about. Tonight I want to tell you, there's a better day coming. After the lake of fire has burned out, John said he saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Oh, I got to read this. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. I'm tired of funerals too, aren't you? Not going to bury any more relatives then. Behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven and all the proud. Yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up. Leave them neither root nor branch. Root, the devil, branch, his folks. 
But John said, I saw the holy city. New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And then there's going to be this new earth that God's going to create on the ashes of the wicked. Malachi 4. And ladies and gentlemen, when that thing happens, the prophet Isaiah said that the lamb and the wolf are going to lie down together. Just like it was in the Garden of Eden. Would you say amen out there? And not only that, but all of these fierce animals are going to be there, but a little child shall lead. Let me read it to you. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And then it says, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. I want to be there, don't you? I want to live in a land without a devil, don't you? Oh, bless the Lord tonight. It's coming. There it is, the story of how an angel became a devil and the devil meant he has wrought, but it ends up with Christ winning one more time and one last time. And it says never will he be anymore. Oh, I want to be on the Lord's side when that day comes, don't you? There's going to be peace in the valley. Some of us have gone through a hard time. I was talking to my wife the other day and we were talking about a loved one who seems to be suffering so much. And I said to my wife, you know what? Heaven is going to be sweet. Think about it. Time to close, but think about it. Look at here. If you've gone through life on the flowery beds of ease and you make it to heaven, it's going to be wonderful. Because if it doesn't happen to you, it happens to your family. It happens to somebody you love. You, you can't escape the results of sin. But some of our people have been under the devil's fist. Some of our people have suffered. Some of them have had to come up the rough side of the mountain. Some of our people have cried all night long. Some of our people have languished on hospital beds. Some of our people have been shut away in institutions. Some of our people have not been cared for by their own children. And, 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 and black folks especially have had a double cross to carry. That's why black folks amongst all folks ought to try to go to heaven. What do you say out there? Heaven's going to be sweet. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all that is within me, praise his holy name because that hope is in my heart tonight. When I look at myself, I don't see how I can make it. But when I look at Jesus, I don't see how I can be lost. He loves me so. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And he's coming back again. Ain't no power on earth can keep him back he'll say to the north give up and to the south keep not back bring my sons from afar my daughters from the ends of the earth and like popcorn on a hot stove the earth will give up her dead loved ones are going to be reunited and with thundering tread we're going to mount the skies and when the saints go marching in we're going to be with Jesus forevermore and study war no more that's the hope for those who love him and obey him. Oh, it's going to be worth it. Whatever you have to go through, it's going to be worth it. Going to be worth it. The Bible says that when you get to glory, it's going to be so wonderful, the former things will not be remembered nor brought to mind. Some of these old mean husbands might have beat you. You might have had all kinds of problems, sicknesses and diseases and cripplings and everything else. But when you get to heaven and you got your glorified body and you can run and not faint and you can walk and not get weary. When you get to heaven, you'll stop and scratch your head and try to remember how you got over. You'll try to remember what you had to go through. And it's so wonderful up there, you can't even remember... How many of you want to go? Stand up. <laughs> yes, sir. How many of you want to go so badly tonight you want the Lord to get you ready? Raise your hand. Let's tell him that and close this meeting. Lord, that's what we mean. Help us. We want to be saved. This old world is not our home. Too much trouble down here. Too many problems. Too many pains. Too many heartaches, too much sickness. 
Lord, we've been through something down here. I'm praying for myself now. I want to make it when you come through your grace. And I'm praying for this audience you've given me. Oh, Lord, have mercy on everyone. Every child, every man, every woman. Help us, Lord, to be sincere as we stand. And help us to be willing to give up anything and everything just to be yours and just to behold your face. Help us then by the grace of God, by the Spirit of God dwelling in us to so live that when the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ are raised and all your people, that redeemed, blood-washed army shall start rising up to meet you in the clouds. Help us, Lord, that we'll be there. Don't leave us down here, but take us home with you. And throughout the rolling eons of eternal future, we'll cast out golden crowns at your feet and we'll worship only thee. We will say to God be the glory. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Have mercy upon us tonight and make it so, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Saints, there is someone who cares when the devil hounds your soul. There is someone who cares when sin gets out of control. There is someone who cares when death is taking its toll. And that someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares when you don't know what to do. There is someone who cares when the devil keeps bothering you. There is someone who cares. He'll help you make it through. Because that someone who cares is Jesus. And now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May you rest well and may grace and providence cover you and keep you tomorrow and tomorrow night. Tomorrow night our subject here will be the sin that God can't forgive. The unpardonable sin. Oh, don't let anything keep you away. Plan to be present. And may God bring you here safely as our prayer in the name of Jesus who loves us and died that we might live. Let everybody say amen. And may God bless you, my beloved friends. Please take care of yourselves. Leave our pencils. And as you go home, keep on thinking about Jesus. God bless you. You have been listening to another special American Cassette Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International Copyright American Cassette Ministries, all rights reserved. To order CDs or audio cassettes of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 1-800-233-4450. International calls, please dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americancassette.org. There you will discover the largest selection of genuine Adventist preaching available. American Cassette Ministries is not a one-man band. It's an orchestra of outstanding speakers who are all on the same theological page. You can trust ACM. There is no compromise here. If American Cassette Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony. Our email address is info at americancassette.org. We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and financial support are important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. Peace coming soon.